I also want to acknowledge a couple of individuals who are here tonight who are really key contributors to the Biodiversity St. Louis effort. Sheila Voss, Vice President of Education at Missouri Botanical Garden. She's standing in the back. Deborah Frank, our Vice President of Sustainability, who is not here with us tonight. She is in New York State, memorializing the life of her mother. Matt D'Angelo, our biodiversity intern. Matt, you're v way in the back row there. Matt was your bartender tonight. You met him. And Christine Hansen, responsible for the beautiful slides that you saw at the beginning of this, con uh, of this uh, convocation. Christine has been working with us through most of this calendar year as a volunteer and is a very key contributor to Biodiversity St. Louis. Christine, thank you. Our sister organization, the St. Louis Zoo, plants and animals, right? Two big kingdoms of living things. Missouri Botanical Garden convened this initiative, Biodiversity St. Louis, and immediately we looked to our partners in the St. Louis Zoo to be able to call together the organizations and the individuals that care about biodiversity. My dear friend Louise Bradshaw, the curator of, of education at the zoo, has been concerned for many years about the ways in researching, promoting the ways in which we engage humans in caring about this stuff. And when the St. Louis Zoo hired our next speaker, Dr. Adrian Cerezo. They hired a social ecologist whose bailiwick is getting into the psyches of humans and digging around and messing around and trying to get humans more engaged in all this stuff. So please welcome our next speaker, Adrian Cerezo. Just to level the playing field, I guess I should start by pointing out that I am an honorary woman at the climate negotiations. Um, I am. I, I coalesce with the women's caucus at the climate negotiations, and I'm the one guy there. It's, I, it's an honor, and it's an honor to be here tonight, and it's an incredible honor to follow people that I'm sort of groupies to. Uh, <laughs> that uh, I love the opportunity to sort of speak to the other part of the question. If we're not going to go out and loot and collapse society after hearing what we just heard, what are we going to do? Um, so I decided to talk about the next big idea in biodiversity. And I'm hoping, I, I'm still trying to gauge the humor thing here. So I'm hoping that my visual puns are going to be somehow useful, but who knows. Um, oh, and I'm the Associate Director for Conservation Education Research at the San Luis Zoo. That's my actual title, but I don't want anybody repeating it because it's such a mouthful. I did realize that they're doing this to sort of mess with me, so it's the longest title in the zoo. Anyway, so... Um, so the zoo, the botanical garden, institutions that, apart from the science that is done there, spend a lot of time trying to figure out what to tell you about what you need to know about biodiversity and what do you need to do about biodiversity conservation and will, what will you do to save nature. My job as a social ecologist, as, as an uh, institutional anthropologist, is to ask the other question. What are we going to do as institutions to make it possible for people to have a constructive role in promoting conservation? So I decided it's time to talk about the next big idea in biodiversity. And I want to begin with that curve that you just saw in Kira's amazing presentation. Uh, because I was thinking about this, a lot of things came together. You see a top of what seems like mud here. It's part of me using the ultimate presentation aid. Uh, but it begins with this curve, in a sense, because this, this story is sort of what we're talking about, uh, that, that idea that when we're thinking about conservation and, and conservation behavior, we have this problem that the, we don't see the horizon far enough to know that if we keep doing what we're doing, we are going to collapse the capacity of the planet. The resiliency of the planet is not going to be able to hold. So, so that's horrible. Uh, 
as time moves forward and we degrade systems more, there is a point where we the system collapses, but it's difficult to see where that's happening. And in landscape ecology, we talk in terms of sinks and sources because it's not a matter of balance or not balance. It's a matter of is the, sink, is the system presenting a trend towards staying healthy or is it presenting a general historic trend towards reaching this point of collapse at some point? But then I thought, what does it look like in the other direction? And particularly, what does that all mean in the context of social and social practices and conservation practice? And so I had this sort of crazy idea that I played around with, I with in collaboration with um, Dr. Krakos. Uh, what what does what do what can we learn in our business when we're thinking about this? Uh, and so this idea came to mind that when we are thinking about conservation behavior. We seem to be operating around here. We're at the beginning. We still haven't quite figured out what that world of conservation practice looks like. And so we're sort of accumulating, we're on the, what is the end for a collapse system? It's the beginning for us. We're at the beginning of trying to figure out how to grow towards there, resilience. How do we get up there? And we work out of big institutions that have long histories. And these institutions are very good at putting together whales, collect a lot of money, put together a huge initiative. That's what we have done. There is a, a reasonable, a fairly clear historical reason for that. How do you access funding? How do you implement programs, etc.? And so we take those whales and just like in the story of biodiversity or any story, hi natural history of biodiversity, we plop them in the city <laughs> and it might work or not. Uh, the thing is that when it's this big, if it works, it's gonna be awesome. I mean, having a whale in one of those pools there, but if it doesn't work, it's going to rot and fester and it's, not, it's gonna be bad in so many ways. So then in this conversation with Dr. Krakos, uh, this thing came up, and, and it's not new. I mean, I've seen bees before. I've become very intimate as I'm working in my garden with wasps and all of that, and the, the work by our insect curator who's here at the, at the San Luis Zoo, Ed Spivak, uh, is also focusing on promoting pollination and pollinators, etc. And I was thinking about that, about um, that, and about something I just read that um, 10 years ago, it took $5 million to seed a tech company. The same kind of company can be seeded right now, can be begun right now with $50,000. The world has changed in the last 10 years significantly. It took a whole production company, a, a whole city, to put together a movie in 1920. Now you just need a camera and one person willing to do it. And so my question was, what does the world look like if we apply those principles of what's happening to finance and the economy and growth in the United States and in the world to the questions of social entrepreneurship and social endeavors and conservation? Well, hopefully it looks like this. Well, hopefully it never will look like this in some ways, <laughs> but for some people maybe, but so, so I decided again to bring up and, and to share with you the ultimate in presentation aids, an actual human being. And so I'm going to introduce you to somebody who is a bee, if we think of bees as the opportunity of having a swarm of bees take over this process, or at least help us work through this process. Um, this particular bee is called Catherine L Lever? Lever? Lever. Okay, I'm having problems with her last name. And he put to, she put together a fantastic small project out of the universe, WashU, in the art department. And for the next five minutes, she's going to tell us about it. And I'm going to tell you what's going to happen with that. Yeah. Do you want to get some for uh, later? I can take some. Well, later. I have some in my studio. So okay. <laughs> you can go to everyone else. So what do they do with that? Um, well, this is a mixture of dirt and worm castings and native wildflower seeds 
and take a little bit, ball it up and take it home and it'll dry out and maybe throw it on Sunday because it'll grow. Um, and it's supposed to rain on Sunday, so it's perfect. Um, these are tools to help create biodiversity in neighborhoods and they are seed bombs brought up from guerrilla gardening techniques so they can be thrown into a place that you might think uh, needs rehabilitation but if you went onto the property it would be trespassing so um, take some action <laughs> so besides being a bee I'm a Washington University sculpture major in my senior year and a part of the Washington University sculpture department program is that in your junior year you propo you propose a sculpture to uh, University City and instead of a physical sculpture originally my plan was to ask for funding and I was going to make like thousands of seed bombs and like steal out in the middle of the night and just pepper the city with them and you know in a few weeks or months all these flowers would pop up in the end I realized that in doing so yes I would like beautify and improve the city in like very small ways but there would have been no mark of what I'd done on like the collective mind of the city so in the end I took the project from the independent and the individual to the educational and went into Barbara C. Jordan Elementary School and talked to 75 fourth graders um, University City is sort of perfect for this kind of project. It already has a lot of programs uh, devoted to improving the green spaces in the city um, and devoted to educating the citizens about um, the nature around them and how lucky they are to have, like, well, okay, each elementary school is associated with a park, is what I learned when I was going to propose this. Barbara C. Jordan's Park is right next door, and all the kids, when I talked to them about it, were just completely like uh, distraught at the idea that they might not you know have a green space to play in and we're actually very aware of the advantages of having green spaces in the urban environment already before I talked to them. Um, I went in with 75 sketchbooks so I could talk to the kids for a few weeks ahead of schedule before providing them with seed bombs. Um, each of them had their own individual sketchbook which they could keep uh, and draw in and do little projects in because I was trying to drive home the lessons of service to your community, improving green spaces, um, and like what their lives would be like without green spaces in a city. This kid, I really loved her. She made this really creepy face with her seed bomb. Um, and this is a big part of it. The stuff you have right now is really wet, but if you wait, like, maybe tomorrow morning, you can shape it uh, like clay. And that was a hu really crucial element with the children, was letting them shape their seed bombs to their own liking and make their own art with it, which they would then throw and create beauty in the city with their art and allow them to be creative um, through their service. Also, if you tell a kid that you're going to take a photo of something they've made, they all just line up. It's great. I've got hundreds of, like, many of the same children. <laughs> um, the kids were all incredibly excited about making things, and most of them were very excited about getting their hands dirty. It really ranged, honestly. But what really surprised me about the kids was how... Um, how much they already appreciated the like biodiversity and plant life around them. Um, and even more so when I asked, and there was lots of like listing and asking questions in the sketchbooks, when I asked, um, can you think of a place where you would throw your seed bomb, many of them can come up with four or five like really excellent places, like the alleyway uh, near my dad's house or in front of the grocery store down the street or just all these places around them that had been abandoned or um, just ignored by the community that they were planning to improve. Um, and so I felt really comfortable pretty much unleashing them upon the city 
with <laughs> with all these new uh oh it's past my stuff we're stick on him <laughs> um so essentially while i'm a bee and they're bees um each of these little bees went out and threw two seed bombs one of them an annual and one a perennial perennial and all of them native to this to this area and 75 little bees <laughs> throwing these bombs doesn't make that much of an impact but in their lives it does and ideas that are small like mine um, and pretty easily funded I think sort of create this web and network of people thinking creatively about solving larger problems in smaller ways thank you I met Catherine last Saturday as I was thinking about this talk and I was thinking uh, I, we really don't know how to do this and so I figured let's ask somebody who does and it turns out that there are many initiatives like this running around and that's um, but before I get to the, the sermonizing about it let me show you another really cool part of it um, this is how this project is really you see this thing here those are the notices to the parents they're made in paper embedded with seeds and they're meant to be thrown away and you get sweet basil when you do that um, another cool feature of it you see those really cool boxes she spends she spent zeros of dollars getting them because they are all repurposed from the pipette boxes in the washu labs so this uh, this was again part of the genius of this so let's get back to this curve so here we are we're institutions that are at this point and again we do really well the, the, the projects that were described by my colleagues we do that we will be able to do that when we set ourselves our mind to to do the flora i mean look at that I, and again i i don't mean it facetiously this is an amazing achievement we can do that we know really well how to do that but when we are talking about engaging each one of you into this it has to become a process that allows for the smaller things to happen for that swarm to take over that curve because that's where resiliency lies because as as we can promote more of those projects uh, there is a bigger chance that each of each one of those projects will succeed in a small way and all together create a situation where we have a resilient biodiverse and sustainable community some of them will fail but because they are smaller the cost to benefit ratio is also smaller and the risk is smaller so we have a higher chance just like in nature of winning by promoting diversity so that's the that's the question that i'm bringing to the table here i was asked to finish my presentation with a question and my question is let's talk about this help us figure out how institutions like ours like the botanical garden and the zoo can foster these smaller initiatives, can capture them, can uh, document them well enough so that everybody knows what other people are doing. I'm not asking all of you to go and do seed bombs now. That's not the point. There are other people sitting in this room that are doing small initiatives, like Seth sitting right next to Catherine, uh, who's been doing an amazing thing that I have a hard time fully understanding yet, but it's like a mailbox that is used to exchange heirloom flowers yeah and so you take it this uh, hibernation what is it called a cold frame you take it home you put the plant whatever it's going to grow you put it back in the box and somebody magically through uh, the sharing economy will bring you another plant and little by little uh, there are many more people that are doing these things how do we capture them how how do we allow you to unleash your creativity in this world? And the last thing I want to point out, which I find the most beautiful and gratifying of highlighting their work, is that these are not biology projects. These are art projects. And so this is the thing that, that we should keep in mind as we're having this conversation. 
Yeah, it is about saving the world, but it's also about making it beautiful and making our lives more beautiful. And so I think we should keep that in mind. And with that, I, I think, I don't know what happens now, but I hope we can have a hearty conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Adrian Cerezo. So Devin's bringing up the lights, bringing up the house lights. Our three speakers, Adrian, Kira, and George, are going to come up to the front table, and we have an opportunity for questions and discussion.